Chris Zanotti. I'm a gynecologic oncologist uh, here at University Hospitals. My talk is on the cost of cancer care. Um, it is the first in a lecture series that I um, give uh, for our gynecologic oncology fellows and our OBGYN residents. In it, we go through uh, a case um, uh, studies of how um, uh, the, the different decisions that we make every day have downstream cost consequence. We will critique the benefits of some of the common clinical decisions um, that we make in our uh, everyday practice relative to those costs as an illustration. This is a topic that's been increasingly important in our national dialogue and so I'm taking it down to um, uh, a thought exercise in our everyday practice. I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Zanotti. Dr. Zanotti is a graduate of medical school from the U.S. School of Medicine and completed with, uh, her internship and residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Michigan. She went on to complete gynecology and oncology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Dr. Zanotti is currently an associate professor of gynecology at Case Western Missouri University and in the Department of Reproductive Biology and is the director of the UH Gynecologic Oncology Fellowship. She heads the Residency Clinical Competency Committee uh, for Residency Evaluation and is the chair of the Surgical Curriculum Committee. Dr. Zanotti is also the director of the Revised Surgery Program. Uh, she has received uh, a number of awards, including the um, APCO Excellence in Teaching Award and ASCO Merit Award uh, for Mental Research. She serves on the editorial board for the Journal of Surgical Oncology and uh, Education Committees for the Society of Gynecolog Gynecological Oncology. She's also on the CWA Committee on Medical Education. Dr. Zanotti has recently received our own funding and is a co PI investigating letting up exercise for sustained weight loss by altering neurological reward. She's also a recipient of the Mary Kay Foundation grant for translational research investigating single agent inhibition of PM3K ACT and her signaling methods. Dr. Zanotti has authored multiple peer-reviewed clinical papers and has been invited to give multiple talks regarding the new technologies and treatments in dining latency. And Dr. Zanotti is involved in the value-based medicine series and introduction to concepts analysis and application of cost-effective and value-based medicine. And with that, she's giving her talk on cost of cancer care. And without further ado, Dr. Zanotti. Thank you. So, um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, there was a, a few things we uh, discussed back and forth about what I should be presenting at an internal medicine grand rounds, and I suggested um, extracting something from this value-based medicine series that I uh, teach to our gynecologic oncology fellows and now our um, uh, OBGYN residents. The uh, lecture. Um, I think resonates very well with them, and in fact, as I was saying to Kamal, there's not a time I don't groom a talk that I don't learn something myself that changes my practice. And so I find that this topic um, uh, I have become more and more passionate about, and I have spent a greater amount of my energy um, uh, really uh, working in this area of medicine. So I appreciate the opportunity to sort of introduce what I typically do as an introductory talk to our fellows. Um, and uh, these concepts certainly apply to all areas of medicine, but I will use specific examples in my field to illustrate some of my points. I think they are very specific to my field and may not be relevant to your field, but I think they do well illustrate the different uh, decision um, uh, uh, points and the downstream conse cost consequent consequence of various um, what may in, uh, at first blush seem like innocuous decisions in our everyday um, uh, clinical work. But by way of introduction, as you all know, the, the United States spends a lot of money on health care. And as you know, compared to other developed countries, we spend the most uh, by far per capita on health care. And uh, if you extrapolate a, a few years ahead, you know, it's in the trillions of dollars. And we all know that it's burdening our country and uh, perhaps even um, bankrupting our country. 
But the statistics can be spun on a much more personal level. Um, the, um, the burden of the cost of health care really does take a toll on our patients. And, um, you know, statistics are 19% of patients report serious financial depletion for the, because of their medical bill. And medical bankruptcy represents the majority of personal bankruptcies declared in this country. And for cancer patients, over 10% of patients, 13% of patients declare bankruptcy because of their health care costs. So one in 10 of my patients are declaring bankruptcy at some point because of the cost of the care that I helped deliver. What shows no signs of slowing is this growth in cost so that the spending for our, at least oncology increases 15% um, annually. That's faster than the rate of uh, increase in the total health care spending and much faster than the rate of GDP increases. And for Medicare in the past five years, overall spending has increased 47%. Those are the numbers. Spending on cancer drugs has increased um, uh, to dwarf those numbers. Um, over the past years, it's escalated um, uh, uh, geometrically. What is somewhat stagnant in cancer medicine is that the death rates for most common cancers has declined only very modestly over the past you know, couple of decades. And for ovarian cancer, those numbers are even more modest. Some of it may be due to lead time biases and diagnosis for death rates. It's not all due to improved technology and improved treatment. Some of it is due to um, uh, uh, screening uh, detection of indolent biology lesions that, in fact, have a better prognosis. So this decline isn't all because of the increased technology. And the decline is very modest compared to the escalation in cost. So at our current levels of health care spending in the U.S., there's a weak or even sometimes a negative association between spending and the health care benefit received. So we're right here on that curve. You know, we should be right here, and we're actually probably right here, maybe even over here. Statistics that you already are familiar with, but let's just re-familiarize that we are lagging other nations and many of our health care outcomes measures, avoidable mortality, survival from major diseases, infant mortality. Another statistic is healthy life expectancy from age 60 onward. We're lagging other developed nations in all of those health care measures and yet we're spending so much more. So how can we would reduce costs without compromising overall health. Well, there's a lot of ways. We have to identify where we're um, uh, wasting resources. So it certainly sounds like an obvious thing. And sometimes it is obvious to identify low value interventions. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is. Eliminating those low value interventions is rarely easy, and I'll describe some initiatives a little bit later in the talk. Where should we be putting our resources? High value goods or services that we're currently underutilizing. Sometimes they're obvious, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're obvious and difficult to implement, such as weight loss, such as smoking cessation. So we really can identify some high and low value interventions. Just because we identify them doesn't mean we can change as easily as that. But in the face of a failing economy, rising national health budget. It really is reasonable to consider value when making individual treatment decisions for our patients. So how do we define value in a medical service or an intervention? Well, it's a multi-dimensional concept. It's a complex concept. It's a relative uh, concept. It's not a fixed concept. But it is based on some kind of trade-off between what an intervention provides and what its costs are, how you should define benefit and how you define cost. There's a lot of wiggle room. But the definitions will vary tremendously depending on perspective. Where's the resonance? What are the different perspectives at play in any given medical decision? <coughs> Right. Right. The patient perspective is, of course, the most important one. In my case, we have a patient facing a cancer diagnosis, facing their own mortality. 
It's a little moral hazard because most patients have insurance. They don't pay the full cost of the goods or services that they're consuming. They're likely to consume more than they otherwise would if they were paying for it when dealing with their lives. Cost effectiveness is rarely a bottom line. The other perspective is, of course, the insurer. Health insurers don't assume risk. They spread risk over populations of people. So they have the perspective of the population rather than the individual. They're more attuned to the reality of trade-offs. Spending more on one type of care, care here means spending less on another type of care here, given a fixed budget. Of course, there's moral hazards here, too, because most insurers are, in this country are for-profit endeavors. They have to ma maximize profit for their shareholders with maximizing the health of their insured members, of course, with sometimes tremendous overhead. Then you have the perspective of the physician in a medical decision, acting as a patient's agents, presumably with the patient's best interest in mind. Often, and this is, I'm not that old, but I have been groomed in this era with the expectation to fulfill for the patient that they should apply every resource to an un unlimited degree to every patient if there's any potential of benefit, regardless of the probability or regardless of the absolute magnitude. Of course, physicians are imperfect agents because consumption of resources, whether it's direct or indirect, is rewarded. So yes, moral hazards do exist in our world. This is just a, a graphic of the geographic differences in uh, per capita Medicare spending. There's huge differences regionally from 4,000 to 15,000 annual per capita spending in Medicare. And they're consistent correlations with what? How many physicians in that area there are? How many specialists in, in that area there are? particularly how many surgeons in that area there are, how many hospital beds in that area there are. Guess what it doesn't correlate with? It doesn't correlate with differences in health care outcomes. So this intensity does not translate into better health, at least for Medicare. So even those who consider the moral scaffolding to be strong, salaried physicians in an academic institution, what if I started to advertise myself as the cost-effectiveness oncologist? When I go to the community, I'm not really stressing that part of my interests. I'm stressing perhaps that I am the head of the robotics program. I'm stressing something that might resonate with them other than that. What if I verbalized to my insured patient that the cost of their treatment really was influencing my recommendations for their cancer care? You can see the hair on the back of their necks bristle, their, ar their back arches, you can see them you know, tilting their head a little bit. I can't say those things in my clinic setting, not at least now. Or if I do enter that into the conversation, I have to be very careful and I have to understand very well the rapport I've already established with that patient before I enter into those waters. So what can we do? Um, first thing I set out to do really when I started to see that there were very big differences within my own um, uh, field and my own division even with our um, uh, resource utilization, our individual decision making, I wanted to educate myself. This topic was an important topic and I wanted to be well versed on it. So I really set out initially to just sort of become familiar with the debates and I find in my field and as well as in your field there are a lot of examples of high value interventions. So a lot of obvious examples of low value interventions. But there's even more examples where the true value is difficult to manage or takes a lot of energy to understand. Interventions could be treatment strategies, diagnostic tests, surveillance strategies in my case, education or behavior change strategies. But um, uh, I set out to just examine common clinical problems in our practice and just go through thought exercises on these common clinical problems from a value-based perspective, trying to be as quantitative as I could. So I have the journey of one of my patients. And when I do these talks, I always like to add a picture because I think that it does 
influence how you think about a problem when you've got a human being there as opposed to thinking about it abstractly in a vacuum. So this is my very nice lady from Lorraine, Ohio, who would do anything I say. She trusts me. She has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. We did a while back a surgery. We gave her her adjuvant chemotherapy. And at the end of the treatment, she had a complete radiographic and CA125 response. CA125 is a biomarker that we use for response assessment. And so her CA125 was in the several thousands when we started. It is now 15. That's a normal level. level. The CT scan is unremarkable. So we call it a complete response. And we are at a post-treatment visit, and we're discussing follow-up care strategies in addition to talking about how she's going to um, feel in a few months after her side effects have resolved. we also talking about our surveillance strategies for her. So what do we do now for her cancer surveillance? Well, in fact, our societies do have a lot of... Um, standard recommendations and so this is recommendations in, in the form of guidelines set forth in the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines that we follow fairly closely, not all evidence-based I might add, but a visit every two to four months after the treatments end and then um, a physical exam at every visit. We get this CA125 at every visit. We understand that this is how we can diagnose the problem. This is how we understand that they've responded to it. We can see these levels increase if it recurs. We get that at every visit. And we do imaging as clinically indicated. It's not all evidence-based. In fact, many of these guidelines are just expert opinion. But we have recently, um, uh, I say we, the Europeans have recently done a study evaluating whether or not there is true benefit for performing CA125 assessments at the surveillance. So here's just a few details um, uh, uh, regarding that study, but it was randomized. There were a lot of women in the world that had all had a complete clinical and radiographic response and CA125 response to their cancer therapies and they were going for surveillance randomized 50% of them to undergo examination and CA125 testing every three months. And the other 50% were randomized to obtain a CA125, but that was not disclosed to either the physician or the patients. They were blinded to it. And their um, recurrence detection was based on clinical indicators, exam findings, CT findings based on symptoms or problems. And so uh, their uh, goals were um, to evaluate outcomes uh, and quality of life. And so one of the first findings was that in fact CA125 identified recurrences on average five months earlier um, uh, than those that were assessed based on clinical indicators. So we can identify recurrences much earlier using this test. And that we've known for a long time. But we do know that the remissions were not longer in those undergoing CA125 testing, so that the time to initiate second-line chemotherapy was earlier because of this detection, but the time to initiate third-line chemotherapy was also earlier. We weren't getting more durable responses to second-line chemotherapy. The other thing was the total number of chemotherapy cycles was much greater if it was detected earlier by these means. So the women in the CA125 group got a lot more cycles of chemotherapy than the women in the other group, and that's all well and good if maybe there are other things that happen. Um, but in fact, there was absolutely no survival difference. In fact, the survival crews are as close as you can get to one another. These women that had a lot more treatment and had their detections earlier did not do better. So, quality of life, earlier deterioration in global health score, increased anxiety, increased cumulative toxicity. They did not do better from a quality of life standpoint either. So, based on these data is measuring CA125 for surveillance a cost effective thing to do? Intuitively, no, it does not seem uh, as though it is, but let's examine how we measure cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness research is typically a comparison of two or more alternative interventions in terms of both their health effects and their costs. Again, interventions we can 
um, defined in many different ways. Broadly, I'm oversimplifying, but broadly there's two research designs. There's an expensive, cumbersome one, which is clinical economic trials, more sort of along the models of our randomized controlled trials, but this time with cost as part of the endpoint. And decision analytic models, which are a little bit quicker, a little bit less uh, costly. Cost designations, well, assigning costs in these clinical trials can be complex. Um, and uh, controversial, I might add, and um, defining benefits can be uh, somewhat subjective and uh, is debated. But I'd like to share with you some definitions that you might see often in um, uh, cost of effectiveness research and its publications. Um, these are common definitions that you'll see uh, starting with quality adjusted life years. Um, those are the life years um, that are in different states of illness or dysfunction. So how, for example, how long does a woman who has CA125 testing live and in what state of health? So it's uh, got a time component and it's got a quality of life component and it's assigned, you know, from zero to one, zero being dead and one being healthy. It's very subjective and assigning these states can be um, uh, uh, either uh, um, uh, defined by questionnaires, meaning ask a cancer patient what she values the most, living without nausea or living without hair. Ask her to assign a value to that. So assigning these quality adjusted life years can be somewhat subjective, but there are different methodologies. In fact, the whole literature devoted to the different methodologies. Cost per gained quality adjusted life year, of course, one criteria for estimated cost effectiveness. And then this concept of ICER, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. That's the ratio between the difference in cost and the difference in benefits between two interventions. Other countries, such as the UK, um, uh, have, in fact, identify or have defined what they consider an acceptable ICER for an approved intervention, be it a diagnostic intervention or a medical therapeutic intervention, as 30,000 pounds per quality gained. In the US, we have no accepted definition. But again, we want to be right here on this curve, not here. So just some uh, uh, illustrations of cost per quality gained um, from selected clinical strategies in our country can really range, um, but in um, uh, with breast cancer literature in the postmenopausal women with uh, receptor positive breast cancer switching to an aromatase inhibitor versus continuing the cheaper tamoxifen, very accepted quality in that situation um, compared to performing uh, helical CT screening for heavy smokers. Um, that's really um, arguably an unacceptable cost per quality gain. So these kinds of things more, um, uh, uh, more explicitly illustrate um, some of the cost consequences of different uh, therapeutic strategies. So knowing these things, what's the incremental cost, cost effectiveness ratio, the cost per quality gained for CA125 measurement in ovarian cancer? Well, we know it's expensive, not just the test. Of course, there's downstream consequences of the test. A lot more cycles of chemotherapy, a lot more toxicity management, stuff like that. Quality gained, well, you don't really gain any years of life, and it's certainly not quality of life, so we're here somewhere in the infinity range. <laughs> Question for the audience, can you predict the clinical impact of this study in this country? Remember, this was an EURTC study. Right. <laughs> So these guidelines, um, perhaps this um, was not appreciated the first time I showed this slide. These guidelines we looked at up just a, a short while ago. So um, these are still in our guidelines. We're not questioning them. Um, and, um, and we have to wonder why. <laughs> More on that later. So the US leads the world in medical publications and expenditures, but really does lag in applying important findings to fundamentally improve the health of its population, or in some cases just to reduce the cost. So the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, remember that, 2009, 
It was um, uh, authorized um, to conduct research comparing clinical outcomes and effectiveness and appropriateness of items and services and procedures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The federal support of the research was uh, thought to be perhaps a cornerstone of improving health, but at the same time controlling runaway health care costs. Is it the answer or has it been the answer? Well, I would argue that we already do have a lot of comparative data that we either ignore or don't accept or do not implement in any consistent way. I've just mentioned one. In my field, there's another one. We constantly, constantly, constantly refine our pap smear screening re recommendations as we refine our understanding of how to identify risk. As we refine it, we'd like to reduce screening intensity in low-risk individuals and apply it only to the high-risk individuals. So we keep refining our recommendations. No pap smears after hysterectomy if it wasn't performed for cancer reasons. You can exit the pap smear screening program on appropriately selected elderly patients, et cetera, et cetera. So currently, um, despite those guidelines, Lots of women are still getting pap smears after a hysterectomy. Lots of older women are still getting pap smears. So 75 million pap smears a year. Really, if we tried to implement everything fully, it's estimated 27 million pap smears. Again, it's not just the simple decision of doing a quickie pap smear when the woman comes to you for an annual exam. It's downstream consequence. There's a lot of false positives. There's a lot of background noise requiring additional diagnostic testing and callbacks, et cetera. So it's not just the cost of a pap smear. There's downstream cost consequence. We're just not applying those recommendations very well. Another example is mammogram screening. Among women in their 40s, more than 19,000 women have to be screened for a decade to save a single life. And the positive predictive value is low in this population. A lot of false pauses, lots of reasons for that, dense breasts, etc. So the positive predi predictive value is quite low. That's a lot of screening to detect a cancer and save a life. Among women in their 50s, not tremendously better. Among women in their 60s, okay. That seems a little bit like higher yield testing. So as a result, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, this was a few years ago, recommended changing in screening practice. They said, no screening less, less than 50 every other year, perhaps between 50 and 60. Does anyone remember what happened after they put forth those recommendations? It wasn't new data. They just sort of reinterpreted and reapplied, reasonably reapplied that. Um, based on cost-benefit analysis. It was huge. It was a raging controversy over the perceived rationing of health care. Women, you know, women's interest groups, breast cancer survivors, uh, you, you name it, everyone weighed in on it. Everyone had an opinion about rationing health care. So then the U.S. Preventative Task Force said, change our mind, recommend that we support an individualized decision-making process with women so that they know about the risks and the benefits. And so, of course, a gynecologist who has 15 minutes to spend with that patient has to spend 14 minutes of it saying, uh, establishing a rapport enough to, to tell them why they're not, you know, going to give them a mammogram requisition. So it's a, it's a huge burden placed back upon the physician to withhold care. So yeah, we, we, we don't apply our data as well as we should. These are just in my world examples. They're obvious ones. Your world has a lot of, so what can we do? We educate ourselves and we apply our data with or without policy. And so probably everyone in this room does understand about the Choosing Wisely campaign because it started really in the field of internal medicine through an ABIM grant. Um, and uh, it's a set of specific steps physicians could take to promote, promote more effective use of healthcare resources, more cost-effective practices. So um, on paper, it's meant to start conversations about the overuse of medical tests or procedures that provide little benefit. So extracting, that there's lots more than five in my field at this point, but start out with five obvious low to no value um, uh, uh, interventions. Most of them fell in the category of diagnostic tests. And it's a good start. It's obviously not comprehensive. 
um, it's a piecemeal, a piecemeal, but the conversation has started and now many societies have contributed lists and within those societies it has gone well beyond a list of five. So it gives physicians a lot more to go on to have uh, conversations with patients about um, uh, diagnostic tests and interventions that may not be in their best interest, whether it be from a cost standpoint or a benefit standpoint, usually both. So let's continue our case study. She's six months from her treatment, and unfortunately at her second follow-up visit, we see the CA-125 elevated. Yes, we've continued it because we haven't had any indicators that we should be stopping it, and it's really a difficult conversation to stop it because every woman reads that that's what happens after you get treated, is you get those CA-125. So I have to say they live and die by these numbers. They're all anxious till their appointment. If they get a normal one, that anxiety drops and it's okay, and then the appointment comes again, and they're anxious till they find the result, and then if it's normal, it drops again. So it's really it has a psychological consequence that's not good. But this poor woman, six months after, CA-125 is elevated. As is often the case, they feel fine. It's just a test, just an abnormal number, no symptoms of anything. We get a CAT scan, it's normal. What do we do? We have a complicated conversation. We say the cancer's out there, CAT scan's normal, you feel fine, we have option of treating for a number or waiting. We wait. We repeat the CAT scan. We decide when to do it, because it's our decision. She's not on a clinical trial, we do it. We do it in six weeks. We find out the CA-125 is elevated, that's another test. Well, it usually does continue to go. We repeat the CAT scan, that's another test. $2,300, and everything's normal except a single and large para-aortic lymph node. It's just one thing. We have a decision. We treat based on a single and large lymph node and a woman who feels fine. We say, oh gosh, this is probably the cancer. Come back, we'll just treat it as such. Um, I would say that some people do refer for CT-guided biopsies if it's just an isolated abnormality, so let's do that. What's the ICER for CAT scan in this setting? Well, if the ICER for CA-125 wasn't very good, the ICER for getting downstream diagnostic costly tests are even worse. And the ICER for biopsy, not so good. The study is positive. The pretest probability was fairly high that it would be, and it's positive. What should we do now? Got a woman who feels pretty good. She's got a single isolated abnormality six months after treatment. What do we think the patient wants to do? You can't exactly say she's got a cancer recurrence and do nothing without a long, drawn-out, con difficult conversation. You're allowed to 15 minutes. That's about a 45-minute conversation. Um, but let's really, um, uh, I don't want to be glib. Before answering that question, a constant, um, um, uh, you know, a constant need in my practice is that we really need to place this into a realistic context. How well does a woman with recurrent ovarian cancer do in general? Then we can make appropriate decisions for her. So there's a lot of ways to predict it, and certainly we can refine our understanding. We don't have to throw a broad average to her. We can predict it in part based on her age and performance status and all the common indicators. But also, there is an important concept in my field about time to recurrence. And in fact, from the standpoint of doing clinical, re or, uh, you know, clinical research, for example, chemotherapeutics, we actually categorize um, and stratify our patients based on time to recurrence. So if they progress during therapy, it's called progressive or refractory. And if they progress within six months after their treatment completion, that is a, re a resistant uh, ovarian cancer. We call platinum resistant because platinum is our first line agent. And if they um, recur um, uh, after six months, they call sensitive. These all have different, uh, it's a biologic continuum, but broadly these have different prognoses associated with them. Obviously, this is the worst prognosis, suggesting more chemotherapy-resistant disease. Uh, and in general, the median survival is less than one year for this group here. If they recur 
two years and three years out. In fact, those women do well. So I'll illustrate today an example of a woman who's got a lot of prognostic indicators for doing poorly from her disease. I don't want you to think that I feel this way about everyone in my practice. There are women who have prognostic indicators of someone who would do well from their disease, and we apply different resources to them. So this is re uh, relevant to this patient. She has platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. On average, median survival is measured in weeks, 10 months. Um, uh, another important thing is, no matter what chemotherapy you give them, they seem to do similarly. Um, and so the median survival in this category is about 10 months. Okay, so we know a little bit more about her so that we can place it into a context of your future decision making. So what are our options? What are the FDA approved drugs for recurrent ovarian cancer? Well, there's a lot of FDA approved drugs. Not necessarily restricted to platinum resistant ovarian cancer. These are FDA approved for recurrent ovarian cancer in general. How well do they work in this setting? Well, that's important. They work differently depending on time to recurrence. So if they recur three years after treatment completion, those tend to be much more sensitive and the recurrence rates in fact, can be quite similar to chemotherapy-naive patients. That's not true of the platinum-resistant categories. So these are um, some response rates of uh, the platinum-resistant uh, patients to our FDA-approved drugs. So they're fairly disappointing. This is 25%. Um, over 10%, we've got some FDA-approved drugs um, with response rates really barely over 10%. So does anyone know what criteria the FDA uses to approve these drugs for the treatment of recurrent ovarian cancer? A shout out from the audience? Non-inferiority. <laughs> Response rates. Response rates. Response rates, <laughs> Response rates only. <coughs> Is it reasonable? So what are the goals of therapy here? We've got a recurrent ovarian cancer in a woman with a fairly poor prognosis. Well, the goals could be different depending on your perspectives. Of course, we've got different perspectives here. We've got the patient perspective, insurer's perspective, and we've got the physician's perspective. And their perspectives are different. Remember, we have an asymptomatic patient who's got a good performance set. Poor prognosis, that doesn't mean she's ill right now. So, you know, are the goals of therapy objective response? Psychologically, I can tell you a patient cares if the cancer is shrinking. She'll want to know if she's surviving. You know, unless you really counsel patients, you don't realize that they assume that this is happening. Um, uh, without, there's a lot of unspoken dialogue. You may be thinking, let's alleviate symptoms. They're thinking, I want to live longer. Your goals may not be congruent unless you unless you articulate them specifically. Reduce tumor burden, well in her case she has no tumor burden or symptoms. Her quality is pretty good, probably better than if we started treatment. So, um, response rate is just a surrogate endpoint. It really doesn't correlate to most of the outcomes a patient cares about. It may correlate um, to um, uh, things that an investigator cares about. But it doesn't um, always uh, you know, correlate with quality of life or length of life, even. Um, does the FDA consider cost in their approvals? No. It's based on quality, safety, and efficacy. And efficacy is, as we, we suggested, perhaps the, uh, questionably defined. So the rules bar the agency from, making, uh, from considering costs when making drug approvals. Health technology assessments um, are available and um, published, and in many countries these uh, HTAs are incorporated into the decision-making process on all levels before deciding to cover new therapies. Right now they're not, in our country, incorporated into FDA decisions. They are occasionally in Medicare coverage decisions, and increasingly in insurance decisions, particularly formulary incisions. There's a lot of resources used by HTA assessment programs, and um, this is on the website. Um, these are some of the resources that are available to all of us, but the AHRQ, um, you, you know, um, the uh, one in the UK that works so effectively is the uh, NICE, um, and so 
that kind of information is available to all of us, but right now the FDA does not approve, does not approve drugs based on cost, and the cost is increasing. Um, and they are not increasing their definition for benefit relative to that increase in cost. And this is one uh, fairly, I think, important and interesting um, illustration that was published a little while ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, but an article entitled The um, Price Tag of Pro uh, Progress. And this is one of the things that sort of encouraged me to start doing these thought exercises using patient examples. But this is looking at um, uh, patients treated with colo uh, metastatic colorectal um, cancer. Generally considered not curable, the treatments are considered um, essentially palliative. And um, a, a, a while back, all we really had was um, five FU derivatives. Um, so compared to a median survival, if there were no treatments of eight months, these are the median survivals if you implement these uh, expanding um, uh, treatment um, uh, uh, opportunities. So adding the 5-FU, the Gavorin, different regimens, okay, you can increase from eight months to 12 months, and it's pretty cheap, um, and $63 for eight weeks. It's really one of the cheapest chem chemotherapeutic agents out there. Adding some of the um, other uh, types of agents, um, such as irinotecan and oxaloplatin, um, you can get a, an even greater increase in the length of life um, at a greater cost. And then adding um, uh, some of the uh, targeted therapies, such as bevacizumab, um, an incremental um, benefit, perhaps, in length of life um, at a tremendous increase in cost. So you can see it illustrated here. Um, but we, as a, a you know, as a, a nation of caregivers, need to really help start the dialogue about how we define, you know, is it worth it? Um, and those are tough conversations. But this is an illustration that at least should start a conversation about it. And if you look at the average frontline cost to treat advanced colon cancer. Um, you know, that's um, how much per patient, and if you then will um, uh, multiply that um, across a, a nation, you know, we're really spending quite a lot of money on uh, this overall, and this is a palliative population. We are receiving a few months extra of life, but at a huge cost. So, while I do criticize uh, some of the FDA approval methods, in fact, in our own research, um, uh, not necessarily in FDA approval uh, trials, there is a huge reporting bias. The method of reporting these randomized controlled trials really has a profound impact on the adoption of new treatments. So an investigator is motivated to really have, uh, um, you know, uh, findings that people find interesting. Reporting boring findings or negative findings does not necessarily reward the investigator. So often, um, uh, there are um, uh, findings that are reported in terms of relative benefit rather than absolute benefit. So the vast majority of reports are reported in terms of their significant, uh, statistical significance, the p-value. But the size of these clinical trials are increasing, particularly of the common cancers. Breast cancer um, uh, is, is a glaring example. The size of those clinical trials is really increasing. So we are getting statistical significance um, uh, um, demonstrating smaller differences that really have uncertain clinical relevance. So yes, statistically significant, but is it clinically relevant necessarily? <coughs> There's one publication that suggests that only 5% of publications um, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology express their findings in terms of absolute benefits. Um, how much longer the patient live? How many patients you know, needed to be treated to see one additional cure? That sort of thing. Some things from a different uh, perspective that suggested uh, some indicator of not just relative benefit, but absolute benefit, something that you can quantify and then put a cost measure to it. So it distorts our perception of value. Um, uh, and um, the approval of new drugs by uh, the FDA based on clinical trials 
um, the predictions of value based on those trials uh, can be skewed to the most favorable conclusion because these are clinical trials. There's a lot of exclusions based on performance status, age, et cetera, et cetera. So these patients were appropriate for the clinical trial, but it doesn't mean that this will represent the population of patients necessarily receiving these drugs. And insurers are very reluctant to base their cost effectiveness modeling on data provided by these FDA approved studies. They don't represent the real patients treated in the real clinics or the real practice patterns for utilizing the treatment or technology, meaning that toxicities end up going up when you start to apply these technologies across a wider patient, a wider patient base. So after an FDA approved, uh, the FDA approves a drug, there's a cascade of cost and chaos. Downstream events that ha happen all the time, inexperience causing errors and misuse, that gets minimized over time. Then we start to extrapolate the data. Okay, we use it in this setting, but I have a patient here. She's not quite stage two. She's stage one, but I feel worried about her. She's young. She's got children. I'm going to use it in this setting. Oh, she's not really anemic. I'm going to do this in this setting, even though, you know, she, because she feels fatigued. Off-label use, that's the norm. These confound our ability to estimate the true value of a treatment, and they always dilute the initial estimates in any therapy that is introduced. And off-label therapies are the norm. I won't belabor that because we're running behind. Um, constantly critique your own utilization. And our latest challenge is critical drug shortages. You have them in your field. I have them in mine. But can anyone in the audience guess which of these we've experienced critical drug shortages in the last couple of years? And cheap ones. There's no money in selling cheap drugs. So even though this is super inexpensive, and in fact an ovarian cancer front line, we couldn't get our hands on Taxol for nearly a year. Um, Doxol uh, went off patent and then all became quite cheap and four months later we couldn't get Doxol. So this is a, a new challenge for an oncologist trying to do the right thing. Okay, so we have treatment options for our otherwise asymptomatic patients. She could do this or she could spend her time in the infusion center. Of course, we choose chemotherapy. And we're back to our case study. She's got no symptoms, still has a good performance. Says, this is what we choose to give her. Our plan is a simple innocuous decision. She's scared. I reassure that this often works in my experience. We plan three cycles and assess response. But let's go to some more of these thought exercises. What is the downstream cost consequence of that simple decision? So Avastin is bevacizumab. Um, here's some, uh, just some hard data on it. As a single agent, uh, partial responses are seen about 15, 12 to 15%. Progression-free survival, meaning how long before they, there's objective evidence that the cancer progresses after your first treatment. Progression-free survival is about four months. Overall survival, as I mentioned, in this population, about 10 months. Topotecan is a, a cytotoxic chemotherapy. Partial response is not high. Pro Progression-free survival is about the same. Remember, in this population, it's difficult to see um, progression-free survival as much beyond four months, no matter what you give. We use the combination, we get a higher response rate, but it's not correlating with an increased progression-free survival. Response rate is a poor surrogate endpoint. But we choose this. So, um, uh, so these are um, the progression-free survivals um, uh, of the drugs. And one wonders, if you keep getting the same progression-free survival, what would a placebo do? When we do these clinical trials, we have our definitions of progression. They're very strictly defined, and we typically um, would uh, obtain CT scans every other cycle or every other month. So these are essentially two CAT scan studies. By the second CAT scan, we see evidence for progression. Well, what if you gave nothing? Well, not all patients on the first CAT scan would meet this definition of progression. There are a lot of people whose cancer doesn't grow that fast. It's just not responding to the treatment. So we don't know what would happen in a placebo-controlled trial or how this would compare. But 
we do have something close to a placebo control trial, and that's looking at tamoxifen in the uh, platinum refractory population. And so obviously we all know what tamoxifen is. Well, hormone receptors in patients with these cancers, the receptor content is low, it's our belief that it doesn't work that well. But this is a randomized trial looking at tamoxifen versus um, uh, physician choice chemotherapy in patients with platinum refractory um, ovarian cancer. <clears throat> and response rates, objectively, we'll um, almost never see many complete responses unless our tumor volume is vanishingly low. Partial responses, um, the partial response rate is lower in the tamoxifen, um, but um, uh, uh, the um, overall survival endpoint is a perhaps more interesting endpoint because that's um, uh, one more relevant endpoint. The difference was about five weeks, which was about 16%. There was over 300 patients in that study. It was not a statistically significant difference. So my question to you is, should they have increased the study size? We saw a trend towards significance. Should we have doubled or quintupled the study size to achieve statistical significance? Or is the absolute value of this intervention too slim to justify that sort of thing? Is the clinical relevance there? So what about cost? We do those things. Oops. Well, um, so physicians' knowledge of cost is poor. There's a lot of reasons for it. You even have a poor knowledge of out-of-pocket cost to the patients. But when I started to really look into these things, I found it myself very energy consuming and challenging to find out the cost of the things I order every day. It's an extremely complex subject and the cost of the patient can vary depending on what their insurance is, depending on where they get their CAT scan, depending on a lot of factors that just exponentially escalated the complexity of just asking what, what a thing costs. Um, so I to my best of my ability, I assigned costs to these things. Wholesale costs of the drugs, um, if we use average doses of weekly topotecan, uh, average wholesale cost of Avastin, we've calculated for three cycles, aloxy for nausea, nupogen just for bone marrow support, and we get the CAT scan. And so this is our cost for three cycles. I'm not including all this because that's too complex. And so can we calculate the cost per quality? Well, if we compare it to placebo, we can. Let's first assume that placebo dies immediately. Of course, someone receiving placebo doesn't die immediately, but let's go through this exercise. So they live, on average, 10 months in an imperfect state of health because you're giving them the treatments and there's toxicity associated with it. And so here's the cost per quality. The ICER is $65,000 not quite meeting UK criteria even, but not crazy like a helical CT scan in a heavy smoker. But placebo doesn't die immediately. If we um, add that, you know, uh, five additional weeks, um, so compared to placebo, and let's say placebo, um, the only benefit they're getting is five additional weeks instead of 10 additional months, then um, the, the cost per quality, it, it really escalates. So if you go through the SOT exercise, the simple decision of me saying, hey, your CA125 is up, let's get a few CAT scans, let's start this treatment, <coughs> has a huge downstream cost consequence and really of uncertain benefit, um, of questionable benefit. What would Obama say? <laughs> So it's easy to make these decisions, and it's easy not to think about the downstream cost, but there is a huge downstream cost. So what can we do? Critique your utilization and go through these thought exercises. And we do in our residency and our fellowship, we have occasional lectures where we go through simple, everyday decision making with this kind of approach. So, all right, so we did it. Her CA125 increased, her performance status is still good, and I might add, for an ovarian cancer patient, most of the recurrences are intra-abdominal. They can maintain a really good performance status for most of their disease course. And so they become appropriate candidates from a performance status standpoint, um, not necessarily from a treatment benefit standpoint. 
So what should we do now? Well, gosh, I'm one hour behind in my overbooked morning clinic. You've got three cases scheduled starting at noon. I don't want to be late for those. I could have a quick conversation and offer treatment that might satisfy her and have a really glossy, superficial conversation, or I could tell her what's really going on. And I have a decision to make. I'm not rewarded for spending an hour and a half with my patients. And so it's challenging to establish the rapport, to have a conversation that puts it into the realistic context that this patient really needs to make good decisions for herself. On average, how many chemotherapy regimens does a woman with ovarian cancer receive after she becomes platinum resistant? A lot. While ovarian cancer is the, not the most common cancer, Medicare costs per patient are the highest of any cancer in women. Um, and uh, it's in part because it's easy to give them chemotherapy. Um, so uh, there's um, an increasing volume of studies out there that um, do identify the real disconnect between what a patient expects and what a physician is expecting. And often those expectations aren't really explicitly discussed. So you can say, oh yeah, the Tobotecan failed, let's offer you Doxa, it's FDA approved, works pretty well. Well, by FDA standards, it works pretty well. It's a quick conversation. They think they're gonna live longer. They don't think 15% response rate. Unless you articulate it, they're thinking 80% response rate. Maybe they're not even thinking in percentages. They're thinking, what's the next best thing you got? Because I need hope. So often there's a huge disconnect. Unless you force the conversation, you will rarely have a patient say, how much, what chance does this have of really helping me? Very, very uncommon for a patient to ask that question. So it's up, the burden is on me to bring that up. Of course, we all know the statistic. So one of the last things I'd like to leave you with is um, just a, uh, introducing a study that you may be already aware of, but I think it was a fundamentally important study published a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine in metastatic lung cancer. This is a population of patients that have a very poor performance status, a very poor quality of life, um, and a short length of life. There are few effective therapies, short survival, difficult population of patients. It was a randomized study. One was randomized to usual care, and another was randomized to a usual care plus palliative care arm, so not withholding anything, but implementing at diagnosis a palliative care component to their treatment. Visits to assess symptoms, visits to establish goals of thick, uh, care, psychosocial support. Um, importantly though, I think every visit the goals of care were discussed. This group that was the um, uh, palliative care arm, in fact, had a much higher quality of life they were less likely to choose low value treatments. So they overall received fewer treatments, less chemotherapy, but they lived longer. So sometimes less is more, and this was a really important example of that in my field. Um, I'm gonna skip this because it's all unnecessary and we're out of time. Um, so what should we do moving forward? Well, there's many ways to cut costs without globally compromising health um, in the U.S. I think it does start with the physicians um, collectively talking about it um, in a consistent way with each other um, in introducing these sorts of concepts uh, to patients um, uh, to really obtain a better understanding of cost relative to benefit. We need to really start um, the dialogue about how we define value. I think we need more explicit definitions of what we consider value. I think all the stakeholders need to come together and really make some tough decisions about how we define value in our um, uh, treatment decisions. So I um, appreciate your attention. Um, any questions? That was fantastic. I think this is a conversation we need to keep having, and it's really complicated. And, um, I think because the hour is late, we take questions up here. But again, I want to again thank Dr. Zlotty. Fantastic presentation.